So formally, I welcome you all. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. It's really my privilege and proud moment uh, to introduce uh, Professor Claudia Felser, who is, I think, absolutely well known in our community. She does not need any uh, introduction. Uh, and I'm really thankful for on behalf of my team. Uh, so the team members of W2AS, Praj, Kuspendra, Shakti, Ajar, Swayam, and others, who have been a great help in the last uh, two years, roughly. Uh, and on behalf of them, I thank uh, Professor Claudia Felser for your kind, uh, and, you know, um, kind efforts to join us uh, from your busy schedule. It's really a happy day for all of us, and you see the numbers are still rising, and I'm sure we'll hit a uh, big high today of this summer. Uh, so, uh, as I said, she does not really need any introduction, but however, we have young students uh, just, uh, you know, after their school who entered into the integrated master's course at NYSER. And uh, maybe for their benefit, I would like to say a few words about uh, Professor Felser. Uh, I mean, um, as I said, it's very difficult to avoid her publications if you really work in this uh, uh, field of research. Uh, in 2022, I think, she has already published nearly 30 or 40 papers, and even 2022 is still not half of it. I was browsing your Google Scholar today, and already like 10 nature papers this year. It's really uh, better than remarkable, I would say. And uh, of course, hoping more, many more to come. And thank you very much for doing this wonderful research for younger researchers like us, who greatly benefit by your work. So a few words about uh, Professor Fenster. She studied chemistry and physics, at the University of Cologne, um, completing three, uh, completing their both her diploma in solid state chemistry in 1989, and then her doctorate in physical chemistry in 1994. After her postdoctoral fellowships at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart in Germany and the CNRS in uh, Nantes in France, she joined the University of Mainz in 1996 as an assistant professor and then became a full professor there in 2003. She is currently the director at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids in Dresden. In uh, 2001, Professor Felser received Order of Merit uh, of the State of Rhineland Epiphage for the foundation of the first NAT lab for school students at the University of Mainz with a focus in female school students. She is fellow of the IEEE Magnetic Society, American Physical Society, Institute of Physics, London, CIFA, Canada, and the Material Research Society of India. In 2018, she became a member of the Jeopardina, the German National Academy of Sciences, and the uh, ACATE, the German National Academy of Sciences and Engineering. In 2011 and again in 2017, she received an ERC advance grant, a European Research Council advance grant. In 2019, Professor Claudia Felser was awarded the APS James C. McCordy uh, Brody Prize for new materials together with one week from Princeton and Dai from Hong Kong. In 2020, she was elected to the United States National Academy of Engineering, that is NIE, and in 2021, to the United States National Academy of Sciences, that is MAX. In 2022, she was awarded the Max Born Prize and Medal of DPG, the German Physical Society and Institute of Physics, and the Wilhelm Ostwald Medal of the Saxon Academy of Sciences. Her research focuses are on the design, synthesis, and physical characterization of new quantum materials, in particular, Hosler compounds and topological materials for energy conversion and spin products. So uh, with this brief introduction, I welcome you all again. I'm happy to see nearly 120 participants. And I just like to mention that uh, once Professor Felser starts a lecture, uh, we will not take any questions during the lecture. And at the end of the lecture, I would request her to stop sharing the screen so that we all can take a group photo. So that means I will request all of you to switch on your camera at the end of the lecture. We will have a group photo. And after that, we will take the questions and uh, we'll have a question answer session. So with this brief note, I again welcome you, uh, Claudia, to this uh, W2S uh, platform and really uh, express my sincere thanks on behalf of everyone, on behalf of the team, the participants and so on. And I'm really looking forward to a lecture. So it's all yours, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm happy to give the talk and I'm very happy to see you all. 
And uh, I hope you learned something today. <laughs> so my subject today is making a bridge between magnet magnetism and topology. And I still think that we are there at the very beginning. And therefore, I especially like to encourage young people to go even into this field and think about this field. So the field of topology comes from mathematics and it deals with surfaces. So it's uh, really as simple as it looks here on this figure. So people simply compare whether two objects have the same kind of surfaces, like for example, here's this uh, pancake and here's this uh, object and uh, they have no holes, so they are the same. Topologically wise, they are the same. While a donut and a cafe pot are distinguished from the pancake, but they by themselves are topologically the same. So we are looking for the so-called genius of this compound and here's genius is zero and there's a zero is one and here we have three holes so it's really quite simple but we transfer this concept into um, uh, the properties of materials into the electronic structure and then we can really see whether something is topologically distinguished so I cannot deform and uh, turn a donut into a pancake so this is a disruptive process so but I can uh, turn a donut into a coffee pot. And uh, the whole field started, one has to say, even with the Nobel Prize from, for Klaus von Klitzing, uh, with the quantum Hall effect, but I think people at the end, even there were a few more Nobel Prizes, not really saw the impact we see nowadays. And uh, this is sensational. You will hopefully recognize even we can have impact directly, not only having low temperature quantum effects, even to see interesting effects for energy conversion. And I'm quite sure soon we will hit all the record values in, uh, for example, thermoelectrics. Anyway, so the Nobel Prize also already for theory in topology was given to uh, Heldin, uh, Taulis and Kostelitz. And uh, <clears throat> so I recommend also to, to listen to this uh, uh, lecture. So this was like uh, for, he looked for the quantum anomalous effect. Uh, uh, he predicted this. Uh, in relation to the quantum Hall effect. So simply a quantum Hall effect you see in a very big magnetic field. So you have to go to a high field lab to see it. And he recognized that if you take magne magnetic materials, we even see it uh, without a magnetic field because we have the intrinsic magnetism. And this is where we are. We are here in the magnetic uh, 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 spintronic community. So this is something essential, but we really still have to look for material which has maybe the quantum animal soil effect at room temperature, because as you know, we, people in spintronics, they are not like uh, the low temperature physics people. They want to have everything at room temperature. And the second big step was with the prediction of Kane and Mailer that there's also quantum spin hall effect. So for example, in graphene. So when I would have seen the paper at this time, I pro probably have overseen, I would maybe said it's something special for some specialist, but already at this time, people recognize this is really material oriented and opens a new pathway to find more topological material. And uh, the only uh, thing here was that he thought instead of the intrinsic magnetic moments which we have in the magnetic material, maybe spin orbit coupling is enough. And they recommended graphene, but graphene is a light element. And also we deal a lot with spin orbit coupling if you look for skirmions, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so in uh, magnetic material science, so we all know that graphene is a light element. So spin orbit coupling is here not the ideal uh, value if you want to achieve bigger effects. So nowadays we know from all the inorganic compounds, whether they are topological or not. So these are more than 200,000 compounds and they are classified and recently even the magnetic materials were classified. Uh, first, uh, antiferromagnetic materials were classified by their topology now, even the, I think all the magnetic ones, it's still uh, based mostly on the single particle picture. So there's still also theoretically a lot to do. And I also think in oxides, to really take full advantage of topology. And now, even if you take not only the bands which are relevant for transport into account the electronic structure, if you look for the whole band structure of the materials, you can say everything is topological. More or less, everything is topological. Unbelievable. So, what is the concept of topology in the electronic structure picture? So we have, for example, in a normal semiconductor, we remember we have a valence band and a conduction band, 
and the band gap in between. So, and the band gap defense case very much from the bonding interaction in the material if the bonding is strong. So we have a, a big difference between the conduction band and the valence band, so big band gap. As the bonding becomes less strong, we can have even the uh, situations that the band, the conduction band and the valence band overlap. And we can have something like a forbidden crossing here. So we have this crossing points and this is, even a general statement has nothing to do with topology. Depending from the symmetry of the crossing band, we can have this forbidden crossing and open up a band gap. But if you have heavy elements, spin orbit coupling might play a role. And then we open up a band gap and get a part of the valence band and the conduction band and vice versa. So we have then, if we symbolize this by uh, the genius, this would be symbolized by a trivial topology by a uh, pancake, why this uh, electronic structure will be sim uh, symbolized by, um, by a donut. So then uh, this has a consequence because here we suddenly have topological protected surface states, which are also spin polarized and this we like in spin spintronics, you know, and uh, so if you think about our crystals in our simple material, so we have simply, for example, an insulating crystal, so we have uh, no states in the crystal and no states on the surface. But if we have this topological crystal, so we have uh, here some surface states where the spin and the momentum is locked. And this is very special if the spin and momentum locked. I'm super excited about this because this is, uh, makes the electrons chiral. And this intrinsic chirality allows many, many interesting phenomena to investigate beyond even condensed matter physics. We can reach out to high energy physics and uh, to astrophysics and to even learn something uh, about uh, unknown fields there. So here is a picture in three dimension. Again, our conduction band, our valence band, our overlapping area. And I already explained the case of topological insulator. But sometimes we have higher symmetry in the crystals. And then depending from the symmetry, maybe not the whole area is uh, forbidden. So we don't end up with an insulator. We more end up with a semi-metal where some areas are still uh, uh, overlapping or degenerated. And depending from where are these points here are, we call them Dirac semi-metal or white semi-metal. So Dirac semi-metal normally has a four point degenerated states here. So we have two crossings lying over each other. So we don't see uh, this directly. Uh, but in white semi-metals, we have also always uh, pairs of this crossing. And uh, this is the case if we have crystals which have lower symmetry. And these points are also not in the electronic structure at high symmetry points. And this is, again, very interesting because now we have even chiral electrons in the white. So in a white semi-metal, this is twofold degenerated. So we have this two points which are really distinguished. They are distinguished for the expert by their very curvature and by their different chirality. So the basis, like what we know from molecules or our hands, so we have the right hand and the left hand, and we cannot bring them to coincidation because they are chiral. Okay. So and um, the surface states here, the protection then of the spike properties is a Fermi arc and it connects both sides of the crystals, which you eventually see here. I don't see it because I have the photos here on the side, doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, this is very interesting, but the most interesting thing is that uh, the condition for white semi-metal is that uh, you can have a broken inversion symmetry. So this is the case if we have uh, special space groups, but we can have also, uh, breaks the time reversal symmetry. And this is the case if you apply a magnetic field on a direct semi-metal, if we turn it always into white semi-metal. But what is really interesting and uh, makes this field of magnetism and topology so exciting to me is that uh, all crossings in the band structure of a ferromagnet is fiber. And I still think we can find every day super interesting stuff to write high impact papers. Therefore, we have so many nice papers. Okay, it's so easy to find interesting properties because this crossing points, this Y points lead to really extreme conditions. And I think we don't know. I think we only know the tip of the iceberg. And I would say we still will find many, many new extreme properties and extreme properties are always interesting because if you have giant responses to magnetic field, to chiral light, to light, to an electric field, to temperature, whatever, 
So we have interesting things which we could use then for application for sensors, but even also for energy conversion for other things. So maybe things which we even don't imagine now. So for me, this spin momentum locking and this topological materials is super interesting because this doesn't allow the spins to scatter. And uh, so the, uh, the electrons behave well on the streets. Uh, it's not like the Indian traffic, okay? It's not allowed to be backscattered in the other direction. So you have to, if you want to go in this direction because of spin momentum locking, you have to, con you have to continue in this direction. So this has many consequences. As I said, you have extreme properties. So for example, I will explain a little bit later, the anomalous Hall effect uh, is extreme in this magnetic material, the anomalous Nernst effect. And this is why I think there will be a new thermoelectric, but maybe beyond even Nernst effect, maybe magneto whatever. But we think also we see extremely interesting uh, quantum effect. I already mentioned the quantum anomalous Hall effect for this theoretical prediction. Um, Heldin uh, got the Nobel Prize, but you see even axin dynamics, axin is a particle which the people look for to uh, explain dark matter. Uh, in the same way also there's a fundamental theory of broken symmetry of the uh, matter and the antimatter in the universe, which is based on the chiral anomaly release. So this is also something which is, uh, from my viewpoint, super exciting. And you can have even a thermal counterpart, which uh, even is uh, some uh, observation which people have sought to see in uh, astrophysics. So the so-called axial gravitational anomaly. Anyways, this is only a part of what you can see in transport. And uh, for sure, people like to do angular soft photo emission to see simply the electronic structure and the surface state of this material and uh, STM, scanning transmission microscopy also. So this is simply, you have a slew of methods which you already can apply if you have a simple lab. So if you have a PPMS in your lab, and I think everywhere has nowadays a PPMS, and there are already so many crystals around which are having all this interesting or partially this interesting properties, honestly not even every interesting property is yet proven in this crystal. So it's simply take one crystal, for example, cobalt manganese gallium, or maybe even the cobalt 3 tin 2 sulfide 2 nova, they has yet measured the gravitational anomaly. And I'm sure it's there. So I want to stay at the beginning uh, with the Heuslers, and I'm not sure whether I can go much farther because of the reason of time. There should be also a little bit time for questions, but maybe I can, can show more or less all the principles. So, uh, and as before, <laughs> everybody knows I like Heuslers. They are very simple. You know, they are cubic and they uh, can be made out of many elements. So this is a nice thing, we can tune them. And if you want to have a certain properties, uh, especially also with the, which, uh, which we can then observe in transport properties, we really need to tune the material a bit that we observe this property even as I mentioned before, there's an inflation of why semi-metals and ferromagnets. And there's only like zero, I would say promille of compounds yet in, uh, uh, discovered. And uh, so we can mix more or less a whole periodic table here together and uh, grossing a crystal. So we have, uh, uh, we can always easily be describe the Heuster compounds that we have the green atoms, which build an FCC lattice and they are non-magnetic. And then we can say the blue atoms are on the octahedral side of this FCC lattice. And we can have the early transition metals here and the red atoms are the uh, late transition metals. So they both can be magnetic and you can now imagine you can realize all kinds of magnetism from antiferromagnetism, ferromagnetism and ferromagnetism in these compounds. So, and why are the Heusler compound named after Heusler? The reason for this is because they are so unusual, you know? So if you mix three non-magnetic material like copper, we know manganese is antiferromagnetic, but, uh, and, and aluminum, but you don't see a reaction to a magnet, you end up with a ferromagnet at room temperature. So this was at, uh, in the time when Heusler worked on this more than hundred years ago, uh, a really surprise. And therefore this class of material were named after him. At this time, they didn't know the crystal structure. The next generation, his son, even uh, determines this crystal structure. So there are two even Heusler compounds. So we focus today mainly on the full Heusler compound. I already described this four FCC lattices, XY, 
uh, X2, Y, Z, but there's also the half Oisler compound. And you see that they are in some sense related also to the semiconductor. So this very nice tetrahedral kind of lattice, what we have in silicon and gallium arsenide. But here we can really make fully, even in the Hoistler compounds X, Y, Z, we can really fully magnetic, make fully magnetic material. So we don't rely on doping a non-magnetic semiconductor to become magnetic. So because here we have, for example, also manganese on the blue sides in this material. So, and the Oisler compounds are a very nice thing to talk about topology because uh, we can have uh, topology in the electronic structure. I already described you the topological insulators, which are realized in half Oislers and the wild semi-metals, which are quite common, very, very common in the full Oisler compound. But you can have also topology in real space. So where the uh, where we can have a topological uh, property of the uh, magnetic structure, like in the hexagonal distorted Oisler compound, we have this non-collinear spin structure or skirmions in the tetragonal Oisler compounds. So I want to give you a brief example for topological insulators in the half Oisler compound. So they exactly show this property. So they have this, uh, they, they are semiconductors because they are relatives of semiconductors. So, sorry, now it's in German, <laughs> that's the wrong slide, uh, where we have a normal band gap, but we can have also this inverted band gap here. And in this big family of this ternary compound, we can have many which are having not an inverted band structure, but we can have many which have a band structure. And this is from a German article. It's for school students. Therefore, it's nice figures, but therefore it's German also. So you can have, and you see here, the band gap, if the band gap becomes negative because of the band inversion, we have the topological material. And also if we have the nuclear num nucleus number becomes, so if the elements become heavier, so we have this band inversion and the topological material. But even more interesting for me, so is uh, are the full Hoistler compounds, the magnetic ones, uh, which are really strongly magnetic because they have high Curie temperatures. So I also think always about application, and therefore I want to focus a little bit more on this. So the Hoistler compounds they can be also semiconductors. I have to say, so even if you have such a complex cubic structure, so we can realize compounds which are semi. Conductor, so you have certain magic valence electron numbers. You could have read it here in this uh, our article. Sorry, it's not there, but on the Tanya Graf article. So where you really learn, or here also in this article, where you learn about the uh, number counting in this material. But we can have the magic number eight and eighteen valence electrons. It's like gallium arsenic or mercury telluride. They are non-magnetic semiconductors, but here even you can generate compounds which are having 50% iron and two other metals. And then the electronic structure looks like this. This is a semiconductor because for both spin directions, this one spin direction and the other spin direction, they are fully identical. So they are diamagnetic and they have the Fermi energy which separates the occupied from the unoccupied states in the middle of the gap. And uh, so these states are also 12, 12 in each spin direction. So it's a simple uh, non-magnetic semiconductor. So this is a good thermoelectric material. So, but then if you go away from the fully filled states here and add additional states, and luckily in case of the Heuslers, it seems to be they go only in one spin direction. So if we make, for example, cobalt to manganese, I think it's gallium. So you have, uh, you have now cobalt nine valence electron, manganese seven valence electron, and uh, so so gallium is three and silicon is uh, is four. So you can have then twenty eight or twenty seven valence electrons. You put them in one spin direction, and then you end up with an electronic structure like this. So this side, the green spins are exactly the same like before. They are semiconductor, but now we have the additional spins filled into the red. And so we have a so-called half metallic ferromagnet. So we have a magnetic moment, which is coming from this additional state. So it's exactly the difference of the 24 valence electrons, which I put in there and the additional, which I put in there. And so we have, can even predict this. And the exchange splitting um, between the red spins and the green spins 
increases with the number of valence electrons because I have to fill in more and more uh, spins uh, electrons in the, on the red side. So uh, we get a bigger and bigger and larger spin splitting. So, so this electron counting game, you can play quite for a few uh, Heusler compounds. So we had already discussed iron two, now cobalt two. And in manganese two Heusler compounds, you eventually have uh, less than 24 valence electrons, but you still then measure two mu bohr, like if you have here two missing electrons, and you can have also the same situation. So you have a magic number per unit versus the valence electron. So the, the difference is always 24. And then this, uh, if this lies on the line, we have the so-called half metallic fermions. So this is at least the property in the bike. The, the next thing is because you have quite a good exchange splitting because you move the electrons, you put electrons in and it immediately already, if you have put only one electron in, you have a magnet which has quite high, uh, quite a high Curie temperature like 200 K. Uh, so you have then with two electrons, 400 K, with three electrons, 600 K and with and so on until six electrons, you have 1200 K. So, so the Curie temperature, the temperature below this compound is ferromagnetic is quite high. And this is a nice thing why we all like Heusler compound because they are then also useful for room temperature application. So I'm interested in Heusler compounds since a long time. And this makes a bridge now uh, to uh, spintronics. So because the half metallicity was also uh, interesting in the context of tandem magnetoresistance resistance effect and GMR effect. So you can simply align the Heuslers in the same direction, then you get a, a low resistance. And if you align them in different uh, directions, so if they are aligned like this, uh, the magnetization, so then they uh, have no states to go and we have a large magnetoresistance effect. And this is the reason why we have this uh, large tunnel magnetoresistance effect in a very simple picture. And I know from Stuart, there are still people uh, using, working, and so on, on Heusler compounds. I always show this build picture, which is already 10 years old, when I worked with Jeff Childress and others, former IBM less in Hitachi on retails, and uh, I just was asked from Western Digital to start another project with them. Anyway, so they are still uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the Spentronic community. So, but uh, our, we went further. So since we are now also on topology and in uh, 2016, there was a prediction from Hassan's group and Andre Bernovic that they're simply recognized in one of the Heusler compounds, the cobalt titanium silicide, which has 22 valence electrons and two mibor that you have, even if you do a non-spin, if you don't, if you do a fully relativistic calculation, you see that there are nice crossing points. And as I said, in magnetism, in magnetic compounds, simply by definition, all these crossing points in the band structure, even this crossing points, you see here my red, uh, uh, red pointer, you know, these crossing points are high points. So there's an inflation. So, but here it's very nice because they are in the gap of one former spin direction. So you really have very nicely pronounced crossing points. But the disadvantage is here, here's the Fermi energy, the zero energy up to there, the electrons are filled. So it's more or less the unoccupied state. So we thought nice prediction, but uh, it doesn't make sense. But I have remembered that Jürgen Kübner and me already working for a long time on the electronic structure of the Heusler compound. And we were looking also for something very strange. This is the so-called Berry curvature. So we're looking, we're looking for this because people in spontronics like the anomalosol effect, this is the more classical counterpart to the quantum anomalosol effect. So we measure simply the hall in the magnetic material and we get an additional contribution, which I show in a moment. And this comes from the magnetism. And people believed for a long time that uh, because the curves look, the hall measurement looked exactly like, like the magnetization curves. So people believed that this only scales with the magnetization, but this is not true. Already in the Heusler, we found before uh, why semi-metals became into the interest of the general research that there are Heusler compounds which have giant anomalous Hall uh, values. So there was even a patent here in Mainz uh, uh, based on this. Uh, and uh, at this time, we already recognized that this properly, this giant value always appears if you have crossing points 
in the electronic structure in this material. And at this time, we looked on cobalt to manganese uh, aluminum. So going back then, uh, a few years later, again, then we recognize, OK, we have five points in this compound, and this is responsible for giant enhancement of the very curvature, which leads to this giant effect, which maybe makes this material even interesting for our sensors. So then we did toy model calculation, especially in Noki for my group. So I said, look, let's understand. And she simply assumed that we have a crossing point in a simple band structure. It's much more simple. And then he applied spin orbit coupling. He calculated the so-called Berry curvature. And you see it spikes here around the crossing points. Okay. And then he calculated the anomalous olive conductivity, and it always gives a giant response. And even the anomalous nernst effect is a giant response. It's only a little bit more, more distributed over the energy scale. So um, it's not as sharp. Uh, as animal soil effect. So this is maybe easier to find even easy, simply experimentally interesting compound if one can measure the Nernst. So, but you see easily that Nernst and oil effect should be strongly enhanced in this topological materials. So this is now not the toy model calculation. This is a, more, a calculation for cobalt to manganese gallium is similar like cobalt to manganese aluminum. At this time, we simply made gallium because we were smart. We thought if we had published in 2011 that cobalt to manganese aluminum is a fantastic anomalous hall sensor in APL, we doesn't get it into a decent journal. So if you want to have a nice publication, we should come up with a nice compound, which has at the end the same band structure. But, uh, uh, and you see, you see nice peaks in the hall conductivity in the nice con uh, effect here. So the first thing what normally people do, is they look for angle resolved photo emission. And uh, this we did in collaboration with Sassan's group in Princeton. So they did uh, look for this, uh, whether we really have these crossing points in the band structure. And cobalt to manganese gallium shows a nodal line because um, the point is our compound is a soft magnet. So you see Y points only in this magnetic material if you apply magnetic field, but in an ingress or photo emission machine, you cannot apply magnetic field, otherwise you don't get photoelectrons out, you know. So therefore we still see the null line in this compound and so not the corresponding Y points, which you see then when you apply magnetic field. And the prediction was that you see this nodal line. And if you have nodal lines, you don't see femoral axis, you see drumhead electronic uh, surface states. And this is simply to prove whether our Fermi energy and our electronic structure is really there, where we, uh, where we have, uh, uh, where we have uh, predicted it, or where we thought it's in the, in the, in the uh, calculation. Okay, so anyway, as we learned today, there's an inflation of nature paper. So immediately. So since we have a three-dimensional structure, so um, and the Heuslers has so many mirror planes, so all these nodal lines are in some sense in the x, y, z direction, and they're even interlinked. And this has caused the uh, interest of the mathematician, because they especially like this uh, linked loop uh, nodal lines, and especially the corresponding linked loop quantum state in this. And if you want to learn more, you can see this in this new paper which was recently uh, published. So you can see a boring old compound. Many people say, oh, Claudia and Häusler, again, Häusler, okay, she talks again about Häusler. Even 20 years later, okay, I still talk about Häuslers and they are worth to have very nice publication. There's still super surprising results I cannot talk about. I think there's much more to come from this compound. And now all these physicists who were never in spintronics are working on this material. So, but at the end, it's nice to have some interesting exotic topological quantum effect where you see something interesting at low temperature, but we are in spintronics, we want to see something in real life and at higher temperature. So a very nice measurement, which everybody can do. And we also, because we have a PPMS, so it's a whole measurement. So we do a voltage measurement in a, a, with an external magnetic field. If you have a non-magnetic compound, this is typical hall measurement and we get more information beyond what we get in a normal resistivity measurement. We learn about the charge carrier concentration. We learn about the type of charge carriers. We can see even the mobility. And we are nowadays even able to make such good high quality crystals that we very often see quantum oscillation and even see the Fermi energy in this material. 
So if we have intrinsic magnetism, and this was the idea of Haldane, the quantum anomalous Hall effect, we have an anomalous contribution to the Hall. So we don't need this external uh, field because the magnetization is already there. So we can measure the anomalous Hall contribution, which is what we see in ferromagnetic material. And then the curve looks like this. So we have this, this linear kind of behavior here, this behavior at, so we have here, the, the resistivity rho xy uh, versus the magnetic field. And this looks from the first view, it looks like a hysteresis, which you, everybody probably has already measured something like iron uh, in a squid. So you see this hysteresis loop and it's a soft magnetic material. So we don't have really hysteresis. It's very soft, the hoisters, because they are cubic. And you have this normal contribution to the whole effect, but this jump here, is coming from the anomalous Hall effect. And since it looks like a squid measurement, everybody believed it goes with magnetization. But this now we know, and you know also, it's not true because there is, if, especially if you have topology or if you have topology in place, so this jump scales really with the topological intrinsic properties. And this is even something which I think is the best measure to um, prove that somebody, some com magnetic compound is topological. So we then can even determine the Hall angle. It's very similar to like the spintronics people, the spin Hall angle, because this is based on the same, same principle. So, uh, so if you want to make the spin transfer torque based materials, I think hoistless are maybe the way to go because I assume also that we can generate very large uh, uh, spin Hall angles. So uh, very efficient uh, spin uh, con uh, charge to spin con uh, con uh, conversion. Anyway, so this is uh, also quite high and it even goes up with temperature, which is good because we want to have effects at room temperature. And uh, there's one way, but this is more for the experts. So to really prove that uh, the anomalous Hall effect is, this is related to the intrinsic uh, Berry uh, phase. So you have to investigate, investigate uh, rho xy versus rho xx. So you have to measure different resistance in different directions. And then you see the relation. And if uh, it's constant, uh, the rho xy, then we probably have intrinsic berry phase. Uh, and uh, uh, also the value of rho xx tells us a bit in which area we are. And this is here is a cobalt 2 manganese gallium. So it's just lying where it should lie, lie for the intrinsic effect. Then the next thing we did is for sure the uh, Nernst measurement. And here is the Nernst measurement again in a magnetic field. And here's the Nernst value again, it's the, the temperature. And you see it's similar like the whole in, uh, effect increasing, 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 probably to TC, which is 800 Kelvin. So maybe the value we have here is maybe only half of the value you should have. But this is the highest value uh, ever measured in a magnet, ferromagnetic material. But I still think it's not the highest measure uh, value we can measure. And then if you see here's the Nernst effect versus the magnetization, then you see why the people believe the Nernst effect was with the magnetization because this looks quite linear here from most of the material. And you see that you have oxide there, you have intermetallics there. So, so, but now you see the values which are uh, unusual, much higher, orders of magnitude higher are here is this cobalt to manganese gallium. And this is also topological material. So for all the topological material you see, you see a giant deviation. And uh, this is really in an interesting area, even in direction of application. So even, uh, so we predicted then uh, the entire throughput calculation and predicted also despite of our experimental work, also some interesting values, even higher values for iron too. Häusler compounds, they are a little bit more tricky because of disorder. And this has inspired Nagasuchi's work. Uh, to look for iron binary compound, and they found not as high values as we, as we found, but they even made it into nature. Okay, good for them. <laughs> okay, so now we go a little bit beyond uh, and go to the real space. So uh, we saw already in the reciprocal space, you simply should look for crossing points and uh, maybe an oxide, whatever. I'm sure a lot of giant anomalous halls are observable. And if you find an anomalous hall, which is signed that the nurse is also giant. Okay, maybe you have to tune in a little bit of energy, but this is not a difficult task. 
So, but hoistless can also be distorted. So we already saw we have cubic hoistless, which are quite soft, where we can have anti-ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic, and ferromagnetism. But we could also strain them in the one zero zero direction, then we have tetragonal Heusler compound, or we could strain them along the one 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 direction, then we end up with the hexagonal structure. And indeed, many of these Heusler compounds, if you look in the phase diagram at very high temperature, uh, so in, it's very complex. So you can more or less sometimes even uh, design all three. For example, manganese gallium. Uh, so people did hexa uh, made hexagonal anti-ferromagnetic Heusler compound, they made uh, nearly compensated cubic ones and tetragonal ones. So you can very often, depending from the uh, temperature and slight the difference of composition, you can design all of this. And uh, this is interesting because then you have this additional magnetocrystalline anisotropy in our original work where we started a lot on the manganese rich Heusler compound work was that Stuart wanted to have material for SCT run. And for this, he wanted to have magnetocrystalline anisotropy and very small moments. And in this compound, you can really can nicely tune. If you start here with manganese rich, it's uh, Hard magnetic material has a nice hysteresis. So you dope in cobalt, you reduce even further the magnetization. So you can have here even with uh, uh, giant coercity fields. And then you can end up, if you go on the more cobalt rich side, you end up with a cubic structure and a soft magnetic material. The same Heusler compounds are also interesting for antiskermions. And this, at a certain point, we recognize. Uh, because this uh, tetragonal Heusler compounds, they simply, they have non-collinear spin structures. And when people were thinking about skirmions, we thought also some features in the Heusler compound, we saw it, and then we thought, okay, this might be interesting. And you know, so that many people in spintronics, and I'm sure you heard, heard a lot about racetrack memory and skirmions on the racetrack already from Albert Wert eventually. And, uh, and, and so, uh, here, you can even in the Heuslers, you can have also nearly all of them from the tetragonal one show interesting skirmion kind of behavior, which you can measure with Lorentz stem. So you have to fit such a, a needle. And uh, the size of the skirmions are strongly depending on the thickness of the needle. And you see this nice feature. And this uh, is very nice work of Ajaya, which Ajaya has started who is at NISA uh, and uh, uh, I think is also continuing to work on this. And this is a skirmion system uh, also, which is very interesting because it's at room temperature and can even uh, be metastable at, uh, at uh, uh, zero field. So this is a very nice uh, research where also people are now working on, including also Tupura and uh, for sure Stuart, he wants to do a lot of in situ, et cetera. Anyway, so I don't want to talk too much about skirmions because it's like uh, the field of Ajaya. You should talk to Ajaya and Nayak about this. I simply want to continue to go to the, this is also by the way, uh, Ajaya's work, I have to say, <laughs> experimental work to manganese retin. So the, the manganese retin is a very interesting uh, also uh, material because it's hexagonal and the, what we found in theory here is uh, first with De Lin Zhang and then later in this nice work, which we did, I did with Jürgen, I have to say, uh, that this has this very nice Kagomi lattice and because this Kagomi lattice uh, and the compound is anti-ferromagnetic, so it has true spreadsheet. So this is what people always were interested to do here at tire uh, physics, but also in this metallic system, if we have this Kagomi lattice, so we have uh, can have very interesting features in the electronic structure, which are flat band, crossing points, and the Van Hofer singularity. This is what else do you wish as a condensed matter physicist to have, okay? So this makes this class of material super interesting. So uh, this is also, and a few other compounds uh, uh, on the list of the magnetic topological materials, the antiferromagnets, and the, as I said, and what is so exceptional with this material is like, normally if you have an anti magnet for the symmetry, so we have always the spins uh, oriented in parallel, uh, anti ferromagnetic arranged, like one example is ruthenium manganese silicide, a cubic hoistler I took here as an example. Then if you calculate here the anomalous Hall effect and the very face, it's exactly zero. You see this green line because 
we have uh, for both spin the same Berry curvature. And uh, so the both spin direction annihilate each other. So the total Berry curvature and the total anomalous Hall effect is zero. So until uh, manganese three chain people believed that the uh, anomalous Hall effect is zero in every antiferromagnet. This was also consistent with the anomalous Hall effect goes with magnetization. If the magnetization is zero, the anomalous Hall effect is zero. Anyway, so when we did this calculation here, Jürgen and me, and discussed this with Stuart and Ben Hai, who was involved in the calculation, he said we did something wrong. Because it's not true, it cannot be that an antiferromagnet has a magnet, uh, an anomalous Hall effect. So uh, uh, Ben Hai and Stuart they took the na name from the paper, and uh, we still published the paper because we were encouraged that Anne McDonald uh, and his co workers they predicted that the manganese 3 iridium and the manganese platinum uh, shows an anomalous Hall effect too. And they are not determining it. Anyway, up to now, their compounds were not proven to be uh, showing an anomalous Hall effect, while our compound, uh, Jürgens and Mai, so Ajaya did a fantastic work. So he and his co workers in our group, he grow, has grown the crystals, and he saw this very nice anomalous Hall effect. Uh, uh, because uh, as expected from our calculation. And um, again, Ajaya might remember, we discussed this with Stuart and Stuart said, no, 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 Ajaya samples are dirty. I don't believe this, the samples are dirty. Finally, Nagasuchi published this nature paper and we had uh, were sitting for a long time already on this data. And uh, so Ajaya's paper went into science advances since we had the germanium compound and Nagasuchi the uh, tin compound. Also here, we have a giant anomalous Hall effect and we see a giant uh, uh, anomalous Nernst and even a G. Leduc effect. And uh, it's uh, a strong deviation here from Nagasuchi. The results, uh, 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 it's a strong deviation from what you expect from conventional uh, antiferromagnets. Okay, so now I still have some time, I think. Then we thought, okay, can we find even something else in the family of Kagami? So we left the field of Häuslers <laughs> and took some uh, Kagami lattice kind of compound, which has cobalt in it, cobalt 3 tin 2 sulfide 2. And uh, this uh, is out of plane magnetized and shows an anisotropic a structure which we liked because we wanted to have spins out of plane and ferromagnetism. And we thought, okay, let's look. This is maybe a very nice compound there. In this family, you are also close to a semiconductor. Sorry, I have a typo here, it's a three. So we are very close to a semiconductor. So it's also half metallic ferromagnet with a very simple band structure, as you can here see. Uh, it's similar like the Häuslers, you have this crossing points and only the crossing points close to the Fermi energy. So, um, and if you uh, uh, apply magnetic field, you can turn them into Y points, as you can see here. But since it's hard magnetic, if you want to turn it into Y points, it stays Y points. And you see, you have many nice Y points and then many large Fermi acts in this compound. And it shows the chiral anomaly. I had not the time to talk about the chiral anomaly, chiral anomaly today, but I'm super excited about this. But uh, Anyway, the referees wanted us to do the chiral anomaly, despite what the other properties which we found in this compound. We found even this giant anomalous hall and so on, which I show in a minute. But here also we show, uh, could see here, this is calculation versus measurement. And again, angular soft photo emission and also SDM. We could nicely prove that this compound has very nice permeacs in the uh, electronic surface electronic structure. And we see here on the side, you should see if you don't have also pictures there, you see that you have a, a nice Y crossing. So you have this linear dispersion in the electronic structure in this material. Uh, and the Y points are here slightly above Fermi energy. So you have to dose it, dope it a little bit with potassium to see it and add the Fermi energy. And again, we do the same anomalous Hall effect. Nice. Now we have a nice hysteresis since the material is hard magnetic. We can show that it's intrinsic because the values are lying quite well in the intrinsic range. And we measured the Nernst effect, giant Nernst effect. Now we can even switch the Nernst effect since we have here the hysteresis also in the Nernst effect in this material. 
and uh, also very large values. So you see, I showed you already three examples and all the three examples immediately showed the nice effect, okay? And all the three examples we could publish in very nice papers, so I don't know where they are, but they are in, I don't know, nature physics, etc. Okay, so, so you see cobalt three tends to, to sulfide two is also far beyond what we know from other materials. Okay, so, and here we were interested because it's a quasi two-dimensional material. Can we really see maybe even the 3D quantum anomalous effect at larger temperature? And uh, in a toy model, so uh, Yan Sun and uh, people showed, uh, and also I think Ben Hai has a similar paper he really published this later in the context, I think, of cobalt to manganese aluminum. You can say, if you put the, bring the white points to the edges, you end up with a topological, magnetic topological insulator. So the various means between the white points are quantized. And if the, if you have a large Fermi arc, you have a very large area of quantization. And here, if we reduce the interaction between the layers, do we see already evidence for a 3D quantum effect in this material and indeed uh, uh, if you if you simply divide the the anomalous solar effect by the number of la layers you're already quite close to quantization but also if you look with stm at the edges of cobalt 3 tin 2 sulfide 2 you can have you have chiral edge states and the chiral edge state shows a nice quantization if you bias it so it's already showing evidence that uh, we can have chiral edge states and we can maybe have it at much higher temperature uh, in the future. And here it's like what I mentioned. So if you take the, the anomalous Hall value and divide it by the number of layers in your crystal as a function of temperature, you see that uh, these materials, which are more quasi two dimensional and topological material are coming very close to the quantized value. And this would be very nice to have a quantum anomalous Hall effect to make a topological qubit maybe even at higher temperature than at very Kelvin. Okay, so um, I think I should more or less stop here, but I can tell you, so you can go also to this other group of material, which was predicted in the magnetic topological uh, uh, story. Uh, so like this family of cam uh, ca calcium manganese bismuth, which shows also non uh, uh, canted uh, value. And we can say simply, if we induce canting in a material we see, really a large anomalous salt conductivity and then also an anomalous nerves and blah, blah, blah. Okay, at the end of this day, I can tell you, so you, you was patented Euterbium manganese bismuth. This was also uh, already seen as a white semi-metal uh, some time ago. And she simply saw that this, or even there in this paper uh, from Borisenko, they saw, they already argued that the material is canted. So this was the reason for her to make the material, to measure the material, and indeed it shows even a larger nernst effect than, for example, manganese retin and germanium and even the ferromagnet. So this is an anti-ferromagnet with a really giant large nernst effect. So we are reaching now set T values which are coming close to application. And this is simply by accidentally stumbling somewhere, you know, <laughs> taking a magnetic material. Oh yeah, maybe it's non-collinear and measuring something. So I think this field is really amazing and I'm sure there's a lot of interesting physics to discover. And uh, I'm sure there will be also a lot of impact for spintronics in the future in this material, but there's a very low hanging fruits. I'm quite sure that we, uh, we already wrote a series of patents that we have soon figure of merits beyond what people know in thermoelectrics in uh, topological materials. And uh, I think also you should take every anti non-collinear anti -ferromagnet. The question is here also, is the non-collinearity maybe related to the white point? So is the non-collinearity in the anti ferromagnets already a signature for the white points? And how does this, and you know also the skirmions are non-collinear, is there a relation between the barrier curvature, which predicts us skirmions in real space, also in reciprocal space. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of interesting application which we can envision like energy conversion, spintronics and quantum computing. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm open to answer questions, if there are any. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful overview of many, many interesting uh, 
interlinked topics, of course. So on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you for your excellent lecture. I think it's time to take a quick uh, picture uh, so just for this, you know, um, our collections. So thank you, Claudia, for stopping this screen sharing. I request all of you, if you could kindly switch on your camera for a few seconds. Uh, we'll take a few snaps. Hi, Andrea. Nice to meet you. Huh? Okay, so cheers. Uspendra, can you also take some pictures? Yeah. Yes, sir, I am taking. Okay, thank you. A lot of people, nearly 150 people. Okay. All right. So I think uh, we can turn off our cameras and uh, Claudia kindly share your screen again uh, for the question answer. So uh, you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question or you can write in the chat box in case you want to, you want me to read the question for you in case you have some microphone issues. So uh, I don't see um, right now a question. I will uh, ask a very general question, uh, maybe two trivial for you. So uh, I know that a lot of the hospital compounds which uh, you have done wonderful work has been kind of extended to the thin film uh, unit and similar or, or new properties have also emerged. Um, but do you also like uh, recall any examples where the effects have not been found in the thin film limit. Where do you so, expect to let's say? So far, the topological properties are still quite good in the thin film. But it's a very good question. My question would be, could we make a monolayer of cobalt-2, manganese, gallium, and it shows a quantum uh, anomalous wall effect? So far, nobody did it. Yeah, I think several... So it's a very uh, good question. So if one could do this in a monolayer, so... And I think also in half hoistless, I think quantum confinement might work. And you can, in full hoistless, in the half hoistless, what we did already, but this is also not in some films yet in single crystals, we can go to the quantum limit. We can make them so, we can make them with such a low charge carrier concentration that you really see a 3D quantum Hall effect. So this would be easy to get quantum spin Hall effect. So I'm doing this with uh, Lawrence Molenkamp in the half hoistless, Utrum Platinum Bismuth, to get quantum uh, spin hall effect, yes. But in the full Hoyslas, we also didn't start yet. It's a question whether one can do it with puttering or whether one has to go to, to MB. Yeah, I mean, if you are looking for a monolayer, then I think sputtering would be difficult. Uh, MB would be the choice. Uh, for CNG, I think uh, there are several reports already where they found uh, the anomalous NOST effect, but yeah, monolayer regime, uh, that's, I think, a big challenge, an open question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mohindra, please uh, unmute on, on your camera and ask. Well, uh, I don't want to do with the camera right now. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. It's a very interesting talk. Well, I, I'm Mahindra, so Mahindra from Singapore. Well, I read most of your papers, uh, which uh, the experimental work is accompanied by usually DFT calculation. So I wonder what really drives you? Is it the DFT, you first do the DFT calculation and then select the material or it's the other way? No, no, we, I think we are driven by theory. This is true. So we, we also, therefore we have also this wonderful collaboration with Andre Brunovic and so on. We are mainly driven by theory, okay? So very often, I think I have already the problem that my people want to have first the theory before they, they go to the lab. <laughs> I have to convince him, you know? So growing a single crystal or making a film costs a lot of work. So, so and starting the work, and now the people are expecting always very nice results, you know? So therefore they want to be first convinced by the theory <laughs> before they do the so, so, so there's no, there's, there's no accidental, in the whole field of topology, so far we had no accidental 
invention, maybe invention in the sense that we found a new property, but I still think that also many properties, so there are already questions in the chat, that we still don't, we see properties which we thought are having an origin from some semi-classical explanation, I think are related to topology. And okay, can be then thanks. much more improved if we, we, we know the recipe. Okay, I understand. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. There is a question in the chat box. What causes a small liver damping in antiferromagnetic insulators? This is really a little bit beyond my expertise. Okay, so normally you think you have a large Gilbert damping if you have, uh, have uh, uh, so there are some Heuslers who are also, they are ferromagnetic even having a low Gilbert damping and there the spin orbit coupling plays a role. So if you increase spin orbit coupling, you will increase the Gilbert damping. So it's been orbit coupling is some reason, but it's a good question. What is the reason for the Gilbert damping in this uh, YIC? I don't know, honestly. Okay, uh, I think there is a question from a student, maybe very, very uh, basic question. Difference between Dirac point, semi-metal, half-metal from the band structure point of view. Uh, Dirac and semi-metal are very confusing, kindly explain. Yeah, but the point is a very good question. There's no never a simple question. This is my theory. So the point is simply a semi-metal is a semi-metal. And uh, so which means it's simply, I can go back. So it's simply in the case when I have a, a touching point in the electronic structure. So I have to go to my old picture, my first picture. Anyway, so um, like here, we had it here. Now I was too fast. So even you can see it here. So if you have touching points or overlapping area, so this is an insulator. So we have a real gap, you know, but if we have a touching point or overlapping area, we have a semi-metal, but it's, if it's linear, we have a interesting topological semi-metal. And then it depends whether this point is four times degenerated or six times or two times. So whether it's a Dirac semi-metal a white semi-metal, uh, then it might have a different spin, a different topological winding number, even a chiral, etc. So this is a little bit more complicated, but it belongs to the family of semi-metals. So the semi-metals, uh, they, they very often are close to a compensation point between electron and holes, and people are also arguing sometimes, therefore it's a very good question, that uh, that uh, that uh, it's a semi-metallic uh, property which is responsible for the properties, but uh, the linearity is for sure absolutely necessary to get this high mobility and this very expect other exceptional properties like large mean free pass, large, I think also the magnetic resistance effect. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question: uh, How do we use spin shift effect for thermoelectricity? Um, the point is like, uh, they are beyond spin Seebeck, we can have Snurz effect, we can have Magneto Seebeck effect and so on. So far, all the spin Seebeck stuff in the SYN films are not really showing high efficiency, but maybe it shows high efficiency if we go to topological material. I'm quite sure. So we are investigating certain materials now and we see really also very giant responses, but it's not yet published. So, but I simply think that this very curvature enhanced properties is simply, it goes immediately by orders of magnitude. You know, we are not fighting going from 1.5 to 1.6. So we go orders of magnitude. We are still not over the top, but with some of the, anyway, so I would say just investigate compounds. Look where a crossing point in the structure. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question. Uh, why points uh, near Fermi energy can effect, uh, affect the whole conductivity? Uh, my question is why the Y points uh, are very below the Fermi energy can affect the topology? So if they are below the Fermi energy far from the transport properties then where you have the area where your electrons contribute to the transport, they are not efficient. They can be above or below. So you need something very close to the Fermi energy and it's even related to the uh, temperature. So if you go to higher temperature, you have a wider range, you know, at lower temperature, you have the Fermi distribution. So therefore it's also a very good question. 
But uh, you can maybe then dope the compound and tune the Fermi energy, the energy where we see the transport higher or lower by putting electrons in or electron out. So I think we didn't do this yet because we simply, we have so many materials in, in on, the, on the waiting list that we, we don't need the optimization yet. But I think also even the materials we saw today, you can for sure further optimize them for, uh, for thermoelectric application. Uh, okay, maybe the last question. Uh, um, how large the Fermi arc and Seebeck coefficients are related to each other in wild semimetals? This is an extremely intelligent question. <laughs> I don't know, but I simply think the theoretician should really investigate this because you're right. So I would say, I th my intuition is that smaller Fermi arcs leads to larger Nernst effects. Because in the non-magnetic materials like niobium phosphate, we have very tiny Fermi arcs, okay? But we have even super giant, but it's only in a very small energy range, okay? So in the magnetic, we have larger Fermi arcs. The values are not super large, but they are much larger and more stable over the temperature range. And I don't know. So, so I think there's still an open question. It's a very good question. I would say a theoretician can for sure make a very impactful paper. Okay, uh, well, there are still more questions, but I think we are probably about time. So um, I think if there are more questions you can probably write directly to Professor uh, Claudia, and then, um, then we all we will meet another time either way. So uh, thank you. May I request you to stop sharing so like I can share my screen? Uh, yeah. Thank you. All right, do you see my screen? Okay, so this is a small token of appreciation, a digital memento from our team. Uh, I'm really grateful to you for, uh, for this wonderful lecture and really nice interactions. There was a large audience. I think this was the record high of this year, uh, nearly 150 people and uh, all over the world. And I'm very uh, grateful again uh, for your time. Uh, just before I read this, I'd like to mention that next week we will have the lecture by uh, Professor Ulrich Snowback from University of Konstanz in Germany, very famous theoretician, and uh, again, another interesting talk next week, same time. Okay, so from our team from NICER, I'd like to present this uh, digital memento to you. I read it for you, WTS seminar, webinar series on spintronics, National Institute of Science, Education and Research, NICER, Bhumneswar, India, takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Dr. Claudia Felser from Max Planck Institute of Chemical Physics of Solids in Dresden, Germany. In recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on magnetic materials and topology. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you, we really greatly appreciate and we hope to see you uh, soon uh, in other talks. I know you are very busy, but sometime probably possible and uh, it would be really nice to interact with you. Thank you again very much. Have a nice evening. And have a nice evening or a nice day, all of you. See you next uh, next week for the talk of Professor Ulrich Snowball. So stay safe. See you next week. Good night. Bye bye.